You caught me eating. <laughs> <laughs> eating wolf. How are you, my friend? Everything is good. How are you? Busy day. Good. Where are you? Where I'm are you? Well, Lisbon. Lisbon. Yeah. yeah. Raining a lot right. today. <laughs> Beautiful. It's a yeah, it's a nice city, but it's very wet for the last three or four days. So, yeah. I was thinking about uh, visiting Lisbon last fall, but it never worked out. I just wanted to spend some time in Portugal, but it didn't work. I had to cancel. Yeah, maybe next time. And you know, last time we spoke, we talked about how Accept predicted somehow the future metal hearts the <laughs> pandemic the rise of chaos now we have humanoids can you expect in 10 or 20 years time seeing the humanoids taking over <laughs> <laughs> the future is going to be great we're all going to be living living happy and uh, we're all going to be rich and beautiful and we're going to live on a beautiful island is that what you want to hear <laughs> <laughs> It's obviously, you know, the AI is a big thing. It's one of, uh, yeah. you know, it's something that you guys get got inspired to write about on this record as well. Um, do you see any danger in AI taking over our lives? I don't know, man. I'm not really super worried about it. I just used it as inspiration for a song, to be honest. But it is something to, to be concerned about uh to be honest because i mean it's take it's, it, it's it's so powerful that it can do so many things that we never thought possible that maybe it is something that is uh going to change our life more than we think you know up until recently we all thought robots are good for making mechanical things and that we're making building things and you know building cars and yeah. things like that but now we have to see that or we have to acknowledge the fact they can do so much more they can actually almost be creative and, yeah. and do amazing visual and visuals and, and they can tell stories they can maybe do movies i mean even music I, so i don't know what to think of it. it it it's definitely concerning yeah but would you you know i, I always for me it's hard to, to grasp seeing a, a robot or uh, you know whatever ai thing making an album like accepted with humanoid or any other bands you, you know because there's a lot of a human feeling that you, you still cannot translate to to robots even though i saw some videos recently with experimenting robots where they actually make decisions and they oh my god yeah and you know as in you know putting stuff in places or if you ask him he has like a piece of fruit and he has a dish on one hand and you ask him to to give you something to eat he'll actually give you the fruit yeah i mean that is you know that is scary stuff but could it help us or could it could it could it help society or could it just hurt us? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the answer. Any Depends better on than you do. Depends on <laughs> <laughs> But it's it's definitely an interesting time that we live in. I mean, yeah. we're definitely in the middle of major shifts and, and the so called digital revolution that's still not still in it, it, its infancy. I mean, if, if your robot can do that today, just think ahead 20 years, what it can do then, you yeah. know, if you think, if you remember, and I'm old enough to, to remember, probably you do too, to a certain degree, how the basic, the first computers were yeah, and the first digital things. And now look at what they can do. So think if you translate that into AI, then who knows what it will look like in 20 or 30 years. Technology is so fast that it, we we can't we can't even keep up with it. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. And uh, you know, when did you guys start working on the songs for these uh, for this album? A little over a year ago, I would say, in the fall of twenty two, I started to sit down and 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 collect ideas. 
And uh, yeah, so we all went into our respective studios and, and started just sort of jamming and collecting ideas. That's what we normally do. Yeah. And then at some point we all sent in our material and we play it to Andy Sneeb and say, Hey man, this is all the stuff we have accumulated. What do you think of it? What should we start working on? And then Andy and I met in his studio and we sort of hammered out the first song structures out of all the stuff that was there. And then the process begins, you know, it always begins with, with little simple ideas and demos and, uh, and sometimes I get get a little bit lost in the jungle of all these ideas, to be honest, <laughs> because, you know, sometimes I need guidance. And Andy Sneep is great for that. He he basically comes in and, and, and said, you know, don't worry about it. Let's just start start working on some song ideas and then another one. And, and so, yeah, he calls it plugging away. You know, yeah. he, so, he, so we try not to see the big, big, we try not to see the big picture. We just pick one song and work on it and then pick the next and work on that. And then after a while we have enough songs together. Yeah. It's still enjoyable that process for you. You know, I've been doing this for so many years, you know, probably some people would think it would just be very easy for you to come up with a riff or a, a rhythm idea or a melody and just, you know, the song is done. It's easy, but yeah. <laughs> it's not really like, yeah. That. I know it's not, uh, and I couldn't e ever do that. I know people who think that's, I mean, I know people who work that way. They just basically write a riff and a few chords and say, here's your song, just sing something on it. And thank you very much. But I don't work that way. I can't, um, because to me, the vocal idea and the lyrics and all that, that is what the song is all about. That's the most important thing. A riff is just a starting point. It's just a little building block. Yeah. You know, a riff is not a song, you know, not not for accept. Anyhow, we need a strong chorus. We need a hook line. We need a theme like humanoid. You know, if you just take the riff for humanoid, it's just, eh, it's okay. It's good, but it's not the song. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, and it's, it's, a, it's a long way from a lot of times from having the first ideas or the first thing to a finished song. It, it takes a lot of time sometimes or you know, right. many efforts. And uh, with Andy Snip obviously being very old school, very old school and experienced and, you know, he's like one of the members of Accept since you guys uh, returned. Um, mm -hmm. It's still easy to work with him. You know, you trust him blindly in a way. It, when he says something, you just say, you're right. Or you like to <laughs> tell ideas back and forth. <laughs> No, I mean, we, we, we go back and forth about it. Uh, I do trust him, but I don't trust him blindly because if, if I mean, if I'm deeply convinced about something and I'm a different opinion than it, then I will say it. And then at the end of the day, he would probably say, you know what, this is your record. So if you really strongly feel that way, then we'll, that's what we do. He's not somebody who kind of rams his ideas through against it anybody's will, will because he's just his role is just to support us and to get the best out of us and uh you know and sometimes there are different ideas but i don't think we have, we clash that often we mostly agree on what we like yeah it's good to work like that as well <laughs> you know? yeah and, and i think you need a little bit of pushback sometimes which is for me very helpful because like i said sometimes i get a little lost in the jungle of all my ideas or even when I do a solo or something, then he might come in and say, well, do that again. You, I think you can do that better or you can come up with something else if it's not working for him. And that's, that's great. That's totally fair. Yeah. I mean, it's not, sometimes it hurts a little because you spend all day working on something and you, you think you have something great. And then he tells you, nah, it's not there yet. Then it's like, fuck, but it's that's fair. That's, that's good. That's what you need. Yeah. Otherwise you don't need a producer. You, you know, you might as well do it yourself. But yeah. like I said, it's, it's good to have an outside or well, he's not really outside, but it's, it's good to have a, a guiding hand. Yeah. A fresh year always helps, you know, sometimes when you get too caught up with something and you have someone from 
the outside, but looking within and just saying, well, yeah. maybe something, you know, you can do that differently will still work anyway. And yeah, exactly. You, yeah, yeah. You need that sometimes. And, you know, I, 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 every time you guys put out the record, I keep repeating myself because it's just amazing how good the records are and <laughs> how, how steady you guys have been, you know, since Mark joined. It's been impressive, the quality of the music that you guys put. And for me, when it comes to a live show, I'm, you know, obviously there is some of the classics I want to hear, but from these last records, I could hear a set list just based on these songs and I would be happy about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we might actually do that someday soon because I feel the same way now that we have so many new albums that are so strong and, and people tell us, fans tell us similar things all the time. You're not the first one to say that. So I'm definitely thinking it's about time we, we do special tours, uh, just play some like exclusively songs of the new era, because that would allow us to play some stuff we haven't played in a while. You know, because yeah. like, yeah, every set list has a number of classics like Fast as a Shark and Balls to the Wall and Princes of the Dawn. So there's a good chunk of time gets already is taken away for the yeah. old material. It would be nice to play songs with just new uh, sets with just new material. You're right. Yeah. And, and for me, it's like, you know, I, I'm a fan of music first, first and foremost. And I imagine if a musician makes an album, those, those songs are meant to be played live. And I think it's a mm. shame if you don't even try to play them at least once live and they just live on an album. I think it's kind of sad that you don't give the chance to some of those musics to be, of those songs to be played live. That's right. It's like little orphan, orphan songs that live yeah. in a orphanage that never get to see the light of day. It's sad. We need to release them into the public or to the wild. Absolutely. I agree. You know, they need to be, you know, people need to listen to those songs live as well. And, you know, you have the idea. I think you know what you have to do and uh, you know, just make <laughs> special tours for the new era. And I think fans will be happy. And, you know, diversity is also part of the Accept catalog. And this album is no stranger to that. Straight Up Jack, it's very rock and roll gives it us acdc vibes um how did you guys come up with that uh, song specifically this one and the other song is man up those two songs were actually written uh, 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 the, the lyrics were given to me by mark tonillo he had written those lyrics as a, in a complete form and i just wrote the music after the fact which is fun and i think that's the, the music is what those lyrics needed because i mean straight up jack is a very straightforward you know straight up song that's like a rock and roll type feeling it's basically a drinking song you know doing all these references to drinks but at the same time it's a it's the message is just you know don't be complicated don't beat around the bush say it like it is and and don't don't make a big you know don't fuss around. Yeah. And that is, that is typical Mark Tonillo. So that's definitely one up his alley, you know, for sure. Yeah. I was listening. I don't drink anymore. And I was listening to that and I was like, Me neither. <laughs> maybe I, I need to grab something now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we should all try it again just because of that song. Nah, yeah. Man. No, no, no. Maybe I, not. I was a very dangerous drinker. So <laughs> yeah. it's, I, I you know, I, I couldn't feel when was time to stop. So when it was time, that's to my thing. I mean, I was never, I was never a hardcore drinker, but I was a steady drinker. I was every night I would have my two, three glasses of whatever. And I couldn't even go to bed before I had a slight buzz for, for many years. And it's just dangerous. And then you, one day you realize the price is just too high, you know, yeah. the, like the headaches the next day and the hangover. So I stopped drinking about eight years ago and it's beautiful. Life takes, I mean, it's beautiful without yeah. uh, just awesome to get up in the morning and to feel fresh and not have a hangover. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
and be the designated driver all the time when you go out. Yeah, well, that's the downside. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what the downside is of not drinking. If you're in a group of drinkers and you're the only one not drinking, it's a little painful sometimes because, you know, <laughs> they get sillier and sillier and louder and louder. And you sit there and think like, this is, this is unbearable. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling, you know, when people start to get too loud, it's really mm -hmm. annoying. I'm like, stop having fun without me. <laughs> yeah, well, they're having fun, but, you know, they don't notice how, you know, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. I've been there many times. <laughs> and, you know, obviously we have that, those couple of rock and roll songs. Then you have more the old school ones, Mind Games and Southside of Hell. Uh, mm -hmm. which for me are, you know, those, you know, songs are ones that would fit perfectly in a live except set list. I mean, they just sound really, really good. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. Yeah. I think we have a lot of a diversity on this album and, um, I've heard from other people who have heard the album that they like even the, the, the songs towards the end of the album. Um, like South Side of Hell, a lot of people really like, and that is almost a little surprising to me. I mean, I like it too, but I wasn't quite, it's always hard to anticipate what people respond to the most, to be honest. Um, especially when you're so close to it and you've just created this stuff and you've worked on it for months and you've heard the songs a thousand times, you kind of lose your objectivity. Um, but at the end of the day, it's good that, everybody likes songs on the album, no matter in what, in what order they are, because yeah. the order these days is not that important anymore. Because a lot of people just pick and choose what they like anyhow. Yeah. And you know, another one that was surprising to me, ravages of time. It's just mm -hmm. one of those songs that was so, uh, mellow in a way it made me think about life. And I was like, why do I need to think about this now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, is, it, it was meant to be a, a sort of a song about, I don't know, where we stand in life. Yeah. Because, I mean, I was thinking when I was, when I was writing that song and I had the idea, I, I thought, my God, I've been doing this kind of stuff since I'm 16 years old. And in my mind, I'm still 16 years old, but I'm not, you know, reality says I'm 64 and I'm, I've just, just been wondering how much longer can we do this or where do we stand? And, you know, and I was thinking like, you know, I don't look like I'm 16 anymore, but yet I feel like I'm, so I don't know. It's just an honest reflection of, of life gone by and, you know, time taking its toll, but we're still out there having fun. Yeah. Do you still think, do you, or do you, do you think about, you know, the last show when you're going to stop making this do you ever thought about it or it's something that you rather no. think about i do not think about it because i don't i don't i wouldn't look forward to retiring music is not something you want to retire from i think you know uh, i think you retire i i would be happy to retire from a job that i hate you know that I don't like. If, if I was working for a company and I hated everything about it, I would maybe look forward to retirement to not have to be able to do it anymore. But that's just not the case in my life. You know, I'm really in the middle of it. I really enjoy what I'm doing. And there's really no point in retiring. You know, it's, this is what we like most in life. So why would you want to retire from it? Yeah. Well, as long as you can give a good life performances, you know, keep doing it. Absolutely. That's what I think. Yeah. You know, and who, who would have thought that, you know, people in the seventies and eighties are still out there playing metal and rock and roll. It's crazy. Yeah. You know, we yeah. never thought this possible in, in the early days. We always thought one day everybody has to quit, but here we are still doing, everybody's still out there doing it. And except this one of the still younger bands, you know, there's a lot of guys out there that are much older than, than we are. Yeah. And then and doing great shows. And, you know, I just, it just popped up in my mind because I was listening to a seventies record and there was, there was something from that time in the early eighties where the songs would just fade out. 
And my mm-hmm. and, and I was just thinking like, why are they fading out? Did the band not know how to finish the song? Or it was just a time constriction thing where they had, you know, just to fade in, be, fade out in this case because of time. Do you have any idea of that? <laughs> Both. A lot of times, well, we've done it in the past, but we haven't done it in a long time. I guess fade outs are kind of a thing of the past. I never even thought about it until you now said it. Um, I remember there was one, there was always the issue when you had vinyls that they, they could only have a certain length and sometimes you were forced to fade out. And there was also the other issue was songs for the radio could only be a certain length. So if it didn't fit within that, I think it was three minutes or so. It, yeah. it was always said radio would not play that song if it was over three minutes. So a lot of times I think that they did a fade out for that reason. But the other reason is because you were just too lazy to, to come up with a musical ending for the song. You just said you played the chorus like five times and fade out whenever you felt like it, you know, so we, you kind of leave it open, but life, you have to have an ending anyhow. And I can tell you from experience, a lot of times we then, uh, were forced to come up with a life ending. And then you think like, well, why didn't we do it like that on the record? We should have done it, you know? <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it was something that actually, you know, just came to my mind, but I was listening to our, our Raya Hip records and, uh, you yeah. know, so most of the songs were like fade out. And I was like, what the hell? Why are they doing this? <laughs> Good point. Yeah, I've never thought of that. Nobody does fade outs anymore, do they? No. No, yeah. oh, very yeah. rarely, anyhow. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's a good thing anyway, that they don't do fade outs anymore because it was just weird. We thought like, oh, I could listen to another minute or two. Well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, true. And, you know, we talked about AI technology taking over our lives in a certain way. When it comes to you for your live performances, you still much, very much an amp guy having an amp on stage because I see a lot of bands using like those digital fractals audio stuff and you know all digital and if you're standing in front of the stage you hear fuck all (laughs) (laughs) there's no amps there's nothing and if you're not getting the um, any monitors from you know from what's being played i I, that happened like i was on holidays in ireland now for a couple weeks and i went to some club shows and uh some bands use like all digital stuff and I was like really in front. I couldn't hear the the venue speakers or anything. And it was so weird. <laughs> so weird. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you a secret. We also use, uh, have been using um, Kemper amps, which is, well, it's not, it's, of course, it's, some of it is digital technology, but they do allow us to take our sound worldwide on the road with us so we very much i'm very much a fan of it and and yes there's this issue of when you don't have speakers on stage it can sound cleaner through the pa system but when you're standing right in front of the drum sometimes but there's something that can be done about that it's called near field monitoring and that's what we are doing so hopefully you won't have that effect or i know you won't have that effect at, at our shows but yeah it's it's a thing because with nowadays with airline travel especially it's almost impossible to take real amps with you because they're big and heavy and they they break down and you know with these there's with the new technology amps they're quite amazing because they they really capture the sound of your tube marshall amps and and then you have it always with you it's amazing you wish that technology was created earlier? <laughs> I do, actually. I, I remember the good old days when these 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 old tube amps. I mean, we have a, we all have a nostalgia about real amps and real tube amps, but let's not forget that they were a pain in the ass sometimes too, because you know there's the thing with local voltage, and you have interference from the lights, so they go like, mm. <laughs> you know, you get all these noises coming out of them. I mean, there was a lot of issues with those amps. I tell you. Yeah, did you would adjust? It was just it was just the only thing that was available back in the day, really. Yeah. And did you adjust well to the in years monitor system as well? 
I have. I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. Um, because when you walk around on stage, you have the same sound no matter where you are. And if you don't use in ears, if you do, if you're standing in front of your guitar speakers, it sounds maybe great, but then you walk one meter to the left and it sounds completely different. You can't hear anything anymore. You know what I mean? It's never going to be uniform on stage, no matter what you do. So for yeah. me, in ears are, are, are heaven. Yeah. That's that's nice. And, you know, just wrap it up um, for the European festivals and for the South American tour in May. You guys are going to have mm -hmm. Joel Oxtra on uh, on guitar feeling for Phil. Um, mm -hmm. How did you how did you come up with uh, with Joel for, uh, you know, to help you guys for these upcoming shows? Uh, when Phil said he won't be available for this tour, I was basically asking a bunch of people, hey, um, and telling them we're looking for somebody. And I I was chatting with my friend, old friend, Michael Cardelloni from Leonard Skinner. He's the, the drummer who used to be an accept for one year in the 90s. So we stayed in close contact or in contact, not close contact, but we talk sometimes on the phone. And he said, oh, man, I, I might just have the guy for you. Give Joel a call. So that's how that came about. I called up Joel. We met. And he's such a nice guy and an amazing player. So we thought he's a gr great fit. Yeah. Yeah, I saw him. So I, came. I saw him with he's White up. Snake. And uh, he, he's just, you know, he's really good. <laughs> and phenomenal. Yeah. So I think I, I'm really looking forward to to sharing the stage with him. Yeah. Does the these three guitar player system work well for you? Really well. Much better than I would have ever anticipated. Yeah. Because I mean we played with two guitars for so long that you always think like, why do you need a third guitar player? And the answer is you don't really need one. But is it better? Yes. I think it is much more fun and it enables us to do things we can't do with just two guitars. And it's just a blast. And ever since we tr you, you started working with Phil, we discovered it's amazing. We all love it in the band and the audience loves it. The energy on stage with three guitars. Um, so we want to keep that form format for a while. I mean, probably forever. We'll see. Yeah. Very good. All right, Wolf, thank you very much for your time. All the best for Humanoid and for the upcoming tour. You guys are not playing Portugal, so uh, we have to find a way to see you guys somewhere. Yeah, Bang sorry, somewhere. sorry. <laughs> you guys have to come to us this time, all right? We've been to Portugal in the past, but not on this run. Yeah, well, hopefully, sorry. you know, we can see you guys soon. Wolf, thank you very much for your time. All the best for Humanoid. It's a great album. Again, as I said earlier, you know, it's just... It's amazing how you guys keep, you know, putting out amazing records uh, time after time. And it's, you know, as I normally say when I listen to an Accept record, I want to play guitar again after listening to it. Then I realize <laughs> I cannot play guitar at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, oh man, very much. And I uh, hope to see you. Awesome. Next. All right. Thank you. All right, my friend. Thank Take you. care. Bye. All the best. Bye. Bye. Bye.